Um, all right, we are going to get started then. Um, thank you for joining us. Um, this session is called Moving Regulation Upstream, an increasing focus on the role of digital service providers. Um, and the gist basically is that we have, for those of us who have, uh, you know, worked in or, or collaborated with um, uh, cyber policy makers over recent years, there's been a lot of focus on what end user organizations should and should not do. Um, and I think more recently, as, um, as, as two things have happened, one, there's been a sort of rise in supply chain attacks. Um, and two, there's been a, a greater level of acknowledgement of how hard it is to reach SMBs and those that operate below um, the sort of security poverty line. Uh, and, and for those who are not familiar with that term, it's fairly self-explanatory, organizations that don't have the resources or capability to, uh, to really build a um, mature or maturing security program. Um, so as there's been an acknowledgement of those two things, I think policymakers around the world have started looking at um, the role of digital service providers. And then in the past two years, I don't know if you guys know, but like a thing happened a couple of years ago. There was a, this pandemic thing. And, um, and so, oh, this is terrible. Um, and so we all suddenly really quickly moved to remote, right? Like that happened very, very quickly. There was huge adoption of cloud. It sort of accelerated massively. And so all of a sudden, that role of kind of third party digital service providers, particularly in the cloud, became even more important. So I think it's kind of accelerated the way that some governments are thinking about this problem um, and we've seen things like uh, in the network and information systems directive in the EU there has been an acknowledgement of the role and importance of cloud service providers to essential organizations for a while but the EU is currently updating this and is looking at like really strengthening those pieces around the expectations of digital service providers um, the UK has also been looking at uh, that role in their update to NIS. Um, and so uh, we thought that we would come together today and talk about um, this issue because I think it is something that policymakers are thinking about today. So it's your ability as the DEF CON community to help influence those policy conversations. And so I have brought two tame live policymakers with me. Ooh. Um, so uh, I'm joined today by Adam Doble from uh, the Australian government, and I'm going to let him introduce himself properly in a second. Um, and also Irfan Hamani, is that right? My, how, much, how badly am I slaughtering your name? It's okay. From the UK government. So um, I'll hand it off to Adam to just quickly introduce himself and we'll move on. Thanks, Jen. Uh, hi, all. Uh, and it feels quite odd to be speaking at a, a conference here in the USA without uh, a representative from the US government, but we'll make do. Um, <laughs> I'm Adam Dobell. I'm from the Department of Home Affairs, which is the principal uh, agency in Australia responsible for cybersecurity policy and strategy. Um, I'm based out of the embassy in Washington, DC, so primarily engaging with US government agencies, uh, Homeland Security, NSC, uh, Department of Justice, and the like. Uh, I'm Irfan Hamani. I'm from the UK's Department for Digital, Culture, Media and Sport. Uh, the digital bit, not the culture, media and sport <laughs> bit. I'm not here to talk about the Commonwealth Games and all of those other fun things that are happening in that department at the moment. Um, I've, uh, over the last year and a half, uh, worked with uh, various countries, um, businesses, individuals, um, organisations, to look at what we need to do to adapt UK government um, policy and UK legislation to address these challenges. Um, so I'm very, very happy to be uh, hearing from people here. I'm exceptionally um, excited to be hearing criticisms of what we're all, what we've all been doing, and how we've all got things wrong. Because we hear careful a lot of what you wish for. Well, we get a lot of encouragement, and I think that's partly because uh, not much is done in this space. So I think anything is good uh, in some senses, but. Um, we're not, going to get, we're not going to do this well and, and, unless we have real kind of challenge and that's why we were quite keen to come to DEF CON and talk about it because if there's anywhere that people hate uh, policymakers uh, and government, it's, uh, it's DEF CON. 
I mean, I think that's more law enforcement than policymakers, but sure. Um, and and I, of course, I realised that I've done a terrible job at introducing myself. So um, I'm Jen Ellis. I'm Rapid Seven's uh, VP of. See, this is why I don't do it because I don't know my title. Uh, VP of Community and Public Affairs. Um, so thank you for joining us. Um, so to just kick us off, I, like I want to ask the guys some questions, but I do want to keep the the conversation as interactive as possible and give everyone a chance to sort of jump in. Um, so what I'll do, if it's okay with everyone here, is I'll ask a couple of foundational questions just to get us started um, with the guys and then if people have uh, questions or comments they want to make and they are a follow-up can you do like a two finger and I'll try and keep track of it and, and, and call on people and then yep yeah, two fingers like this is also fine whatever works best for you um, thank you so much <laughs> um, and then if it's a new point just a, a single finger again it can be this I don't really care um, just one finger is good um, Okay, awesome. So uh, we're talking a lot here about resilience. And I think that's a word that we bandy around quite a lot. What do we actually mean when we say resilience? And like one of the questions I'm always interested in is how prescriptive can or should governments be on the topic of resilience? <laughs> fight. fight, fight, fight. <laughs> I'll, I'll, t I'll take the first bit, um, and then and then maybe go on for there. So and you'll leave the harder bit to others. Right, okay. Absolutely. Um, <laughs> Um, so, so resilience, really broad, um, really broad, broad topic being talked about well outside of um, cyber policy, particularly at the moment um, with kind of geopolitical tensions. But cyber resilience. So, so the UK has talked a lot about, and the US even Chris uh, was talking about this this morning. It's talked about cyber power, uh, which is often uh, talked about in the context of uh, offensive or um, you know destructive capability. But actually. Uh, certainly to, to, to me and to, to many in, in, in the UK government, it's around um, everything else around what we're doing around cyber. A lot of the, and a lot of that is around cyber resilience. And so I think uh, often when we talk about um, cyber power, we're thinking of the national security side of things, but actually there's a massive um, economic uh, angle to this, an economic prosperity uh, angle to this. And I think getting cyber resilience right means that all of the great things that happen around digital technologies can happen well and with kind of risk minimized and um, people kind of getting the most that they can out of them and so I, for me getting cyber resilience right actually means making a country or getting a country to take advantage of its digital capabilities and it's and, and actually building it as a cyber power and it's really impossible to do that now without thinking about digital supply chains. Um, there are, you know, there, there are very few things that we rely on as much uh, as digital supply chains. I think um, making sure that we've got the right balance of encouraging them to grow, encouraging people to take them on, uh, to use them, um, and making sure that they are well protected um, is, is, is really important. So for me, when we talk about resilience, this is a, not just a national security issue, this is an econ economic prosperity issue. Immediately, but the UK was, if rather thorough, also rather late in looking at the Huawei issue. And it, it seems hard to recounsel the idea of looking at cyber power and cyber supply chain risks without fundamentally trying to reorient how we deal with China. I just thought I'd immediately throw some balls at you. Let's get some <laughs> stuff going. Meet Dave. <laughs> I mean, I, I'm happy to jump in and provide a bit of cover for, uh, for the Aww, moment. Look at this, is the fly high it's beautiful. I mean, well, Australia was a, a quite an early mover on that front, uh, I think because we did recognise... Wait, that, was he providing cover or was he digging in? I'll, I'll let him, if I collect his thoughts, um, on that, just on the, on, the, on the fact that we were concerned about the transparency of, this, uh, of, of particular high-risk vendors uh, and their, their autonomy that they would have from any, other, any government, and I, I think that drove the decision back in, well, back to 2013 when we made our decision about our national broadband rollout, through to 2018 when we made the decision on 5G. And if you read the legislation that was um, put in place, it's, it's, it's agnostic in which country or, or supply. It just wants, us, it wants our telco providers to offer assurances to government that they're able to, uh, of the continuity of their, their services. So. And that has formed a larger discussion in Australia about our national resilience and what kind of 
uh, what kind of approach we want to take to tech writ large, and that's kind of underpin underpinned by a few different things. It's the security by design, it's transparency of suppliers, um, and it's also about the autonomy piece, which goes back to the, the 5G decision, because we want to know that prov uh, providers in Australia aren't going to be subject uh, to, to undue influence from outside outside parties. So, and, and that's, we don't want to be prescriptive in that space. We'd rather take a principles-based approach. Do you want to jump in or should I just, should we carry on going? I, I feel like China will come up a few times. Today, yeah. So, uh, I, and, I, and I will say, like, I, you know, from my point of view, I, I don't think you can, no government's just doing one thing. And so, you know, what we're talking about here specifically is the idea of moving regulation for cyber resilience upstream and looking at digital service providers. The matter of China also needs to be addressed, but it's not the same thing. And they, are, they will be handled separately and are being handled separately. So that's, that's my take on, on it. Um, uh, so then I, I think we got as far as resilience. why resilience matters, but not how prescriptive government should be. Yeah, I think, like I said, we've, um, in Australia, want to take a, um, a principles-based approach, which in involves businesses taking decisions uh, on relevant government governance and technical standards in their sectorial context. So, and reviewing their, their cyber posture regularly, um, having understanding of uh, their supply chains also um, is is paramount in our view. And we've we've done some reviews of the cybersecurity framework in Australia and recognise that it's there's a plethora of different legislation that exists that uh, across where a federal system. So we have both federal um, legislation and regulation as well as state regulation. And across the board, there's about 51 different touch points for cybersecurity entities in Australia. So we we don't want to make that that environment even more complex. So we really want to um, ensure that we're harmonising with international partners those the cybersecurity framework. So. For instance, um, we've introduced some security of critical infrastructure legislation, which expands out to 10 different sectors, um, a broad range of requirements, uh, one of which is to put in place a risk management plans that are holistic in nature, so physical risk, supply chain risk, and cyber risk. And within that, we were, we were looking at, do we want to have really prescriptive cybersecurity requirements in each sector? Uh, and the feedback from industry was that, look, we, can you harmonise as much as possible? So we've basically said, uh, pick one of five international standards, and the NIST framework is one of those. Um, if your board is happy to attest to the risk um, that's within that, your risk management plan that's underpinned or by the NIST framework, for example, then we're happy um, and we'll engage with you. We'll have a discussion to inform that risk management plan, but we're not going to be very prescriptive about what it looks like. You sound like you want to jump in. I, I absolutely want to jump in. Um, so, so I think it's quite hard to um, be proportionate if you're being prescriptive. Um, I think uh, the way we've approached um, policy in the UK in this area is that you are looking at cyber risk in a balance of risks. And it's very difficult for government uh, to say every different industry is facing the same risk and therefore must do the same things. And so the approach we've taken on this in the UK is a sector by sector approach. So the financial services regulator will make the decisions on what exactly it is that companies in that sector need to do and likewise for energy, water and the others. So, right. so, so not, not a big fan of the prescriptive approach and we've gone for a principles based approach but at the same time you can't have 13 different sets of regulations for 13 different companies because actually a lot of what keeps a, a, a lot of all of those sectors will have similar needs and similar will need to respond in a similar way to a changing cyber threat landscape. Yeah. And so, what the NIS framework does is it says there are a number of things that you need to achieve as a uh, or that you need. It, it gives it gives regulators a set of powers uh, and requires companies to adhere to a set of think fourteen principles. Okay. That number might be wrong, uh, under the cyber assessment framework, which is put together by the National Cyber Security Centre, um, and work towards achieving those. And that, that framework doesn't actually say, you must do this. It says, you must achieve this. And then it's up to the company and working with the regulator and getting advice from technical experts and the NCSC to understand what needs to be done that's effective to get to that answer, avoiding a sort of checklist approach to 
to, to saying, yeah, we've done good cybersecurity, tick. Um, okay, thank you. Um, I think just, sorry, uh, yeah. No, no, you've got a two-finger, go, go for it, yeah. Vendors or highly dependent providers? Is that something specific that's come across you come up with? So right, there's there's three big providers and one of them's completely wiped out by something. Can you sorry, uh, can yes, you talk oh, more sorry. to into the mic? Microphone, sure. Um so in considering resilience, uh, how does monoculture or you know, not quite full monopoly, but limited number of Just large down with the question. Yeah, come on, oh my God. <laughs> can you can you see my lips moving? Uh, I'm concerned about monoculture still. It's maybe not as bad as it once was on the internet, but we have, right, um, customers and, and suppliers, right? There's aggregation at the very least. Does that or how does that play into your resilience uh, concerns? Yeah. How about that? I'm asking if that's a, a piece of the resilience problem. And it can be a Chinese supplier or it can be a, you know, Western supplier, but, or provider, right? Concentrated risk, single single point of potential disaster. D okay, so and here, what if what if Apple's walled garden is completely compromised? Right. So by I something? think I mean I think what you're I think what you're asking is what are we building resilience for or against? Uh, possibly yes. Maybe I'm maybe I'm assuming a different resilience than, than well, you all are. Are you, yeah. are you looking at sort of the risk that? One of, the, one of the major providers goes down and actually how do we deal with that? Is that, is that basically? Sure, or it could be a supplier is completely compromised and it's a right. major linchpin supplier. Right. Uh, yeah. So, so I think, um, I think it's, it's, it's a risk that, you know, I don't think we've quite got right yet. Um, and I don't know how you get it right because um, a lot of what you can do now with cloud services, as an example, and what we saw before on telecoms, as an example, is scale provides opportunity, right? So you have these huge, provide, you know, you, the, the, market, the, the market for telecoms was only, uh, could only accommodate, at, for, for that kind of scale, a few providers. And actually, that meant that a lot of companies dropped out as a result because because of that, and we're seeing a similar thing with cloud scale provides com um, competitiveness. Um, I think making sure that those companies are, sorry, can, can everyone hear me? Um, oh, okay. Making sure that those companies, is that better? Oh, I can actually hear myself now, that's terrible. Um, <laughs> Okay, making sure that those companies are doing what they need to for resilience is important. Um, and so, the, I mean, w the way we've tried to approach this with our new set of regulations is, if you are an important digital service provider, you must adhere to a certain set of um, principles and, and achieve kind of cyber resilience. The other, the other thing that's important is, even if you're not one of those big providers, if you are a important provider across critical national infrastructure, um, you know, in discrete parts, so, you know, you supply a bit of the water network, a bit of the electricity network, you might not be individually important, but on aggregate you might be, you must also then uh, be in that. So, so I think there's a scope question on how do we make sure we're getting the right Which companies. Actually, that's exactly where I wanted to go, but I, but I also want to add just a, a quick clarification because delightful. Um, oh, whoa. Okay. Because I think that, uh, you know, regardless of which government we're talking about, when it comes to cybersecurity, there are going to be parts of the government that set policy, and then there are going to be parts of the government that are operational. And though they work together, in an ideal world, they work together. I think they do for these two governments. Um, and so, you know, the policy makers are going to be looking at, you know, what are the general rules that you set? Um, and how do you make sure that they're adapted to the right people in the right ways and who are we trying to target? The operational folks are going to be building the redundancy and resilience plans to say, okay, if 
Okay, so we, we're, we've got the policymakers and they're proposing policy to make sure that all digital service providers that meet X requirements um, are covered by these baseline things that they should be doing. But then the operational folks are going to be like, okay, but if AWS goes down, what happens? Right? What does that mean for the UK and, and how do we respond to it? Um, and so I think, you know, what you want is for them to be working together in lockstep and thinking about those things. But I think the question that you're asking almost orients more towards that operational piece than that policy making piece. But I do think one of the things that we should talk about is the term digital service providers is extremely broad. And so like, what does it actually mean? What are we trying to get at here? Is it everybody? Is it specific groups of digital service providers, specific profiles? You know, what is it? Yeah, I, sorry. Did, sorry. Thank you, Jen. Um, uh, if I can be very specific for a moment as an example, uh, I may have a policy that mandates you must have independent service providers and yeah. two of them. And they may not, or maybe I have an antitrust sort of anti-monopoly policy, possibly intentionally. And not to say that the, the principles aren't good and a certain criteria of provider must meet them. They could still completely fail. If it, but, so yeah. that kind of redundancy, over. Yeah, thanks. Okay. I'm sorry, please. Yeah, so, so I, and I think just, just on, on, that, on, on finishing that, I think we also need to be looking at that sort of risk diagram on impact and frequency, right? How likely is it that that's going to happen? And actually, um, what, you know, what are we worried about? Are we worried about, you know, a company that has built its business model on being resilient and pr therefore providing resilience to others, right? Or are we worried about the kind of 10-person operation that's done phenomenally well, is serving eight different parts of critical national infrastructure, and government hasn't quite picked up how critical they are, uh, and, and you know hasn't quite got its firewall fix, uh, f f fitted out properly. So, so I think we do need to worry about what, um, what, what risks we are trying to uh, address, and also what are the service providers. So I think there are, there are um, you know, under, under UK law, there's the kind of cloud services, uh, Amazon, uh, the, no, Amazon, online marketplaces and right. uh, and, and, and online search. Service, right? Yeah, so so those are included. Um, so think, I mean, even the term cloud service provider is super big, is. right? Like, do we mean Netflix? Or do we, and I'm, if anyone's here from any of the companies I'm mentioning, I'm not trying to victimize you in any way. I just want to kind of get at, like, every company is doing something in the cloud now, right? Like, I mean, Actually, quick show of hands. How many people here work for a company that they think is a digital service provider in some way? Really? Only that many? <laughs> right. I was going to say, how many people here work for the government? <laughs> Right, right. I see you over there. So our, so our cyber breaches survey, which we did early, which we released earlier this year, said 62% of companies think that they use a digital service provider, and I think that's a massive underestimate. Yeah, I think it's a massive I underestimate just, as well. And, and I think this is the problem. I right. don't think people realise how dependent they are on. Because I mean, that would suggest that that um, that what like 38% don't have email. Well, exactly. Or a website. <laughs> um, yeah. Okay. So. Uh, <laughs> um, so, so when we say cloud service providers, we mean infrastructure as a so, service so or in, more? Infrastructure as a service, um, uh, parts of software as a service, um, not yet quite managed service providers though. Okay. Which will actually use cloud services as well, so you have kind of yeah. the compound effect of those. Well, and a lot of managed service providers are in themselves small to medium businesses, which is a challenge. What about MSSPs? Uh, not, not yet included. Okay. Sorry. Interesting. Sorry. Okay. Is that Gabe? Gabe, are you trying to say something? We need to speak louder. Oh, we can't hear. Okay, so we're talking about the kinds of cloud service providers. Um, oh, hello. <laughs> I'm very scared of this microphone now. Um, <laughs> so is he. Um, all right, so... Um, there was a question. Oh, brilliant. Yes, please. Sorry. Right. <laughs> I've heard of them. <laughs>
Right. Right. governments, uh, you know, I'm seeing with DLT uh, that like governments like Australia or Singapore are already going into, you know, creating policy around, uh, you know, crypto and stuff like that, yeah. uh, you know, or wanting to have, I did tell um, you it would come up. <laughs> want, wanting to incorporate things like uh, in terms of outcomes, allowing us to control our own data, right? So things like self-sovereign identity or decentralized identity, whatnot. So to what degree is, 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 I guess, these emerging technologies that if they are actually, if there's actual, um, uh, what's the word I'm looking at? Like if, 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 if people start using them, right? Like, uh, they, they, they're not just ideas anymore, but they're, they become, what's the word I'm looking for? Like they're picked up and everyone uses them. I can't, my brain is... So become Adoption, thank you. Right. If they're widely adopted, then, um, you know, the outcome could be that as a policy measure that we're saying that, like, companies shouldn't be managing our identities. If we do, we get both security, privacy, we manage our own data, we don't have leaks, you know, there's no central point of failure. All of these, you know, great things that we advocate for companies to do. I'm curious what the governments, you know, do they want to give up control of managing our own data? And, you know, it, it, I, don't, I hope we're not diverging from it, uh, your, your topic. But, uh, so, yes, because I think that's a, a privacy regs thing, not a security regs thing. But I do think oh. it's a great question. Um, it's integrity. It's it is, because you can't, you can't have one without the other. But I think the way the governments think about it, it's a regulation that tends to stem from the privacy side of the house. Less, the, I mean, I don't know, you guys tell Cryptography. Me, if I mean, you guys are, are you guys zero looking at... Groups, you know. Is this a thing yeah, you guys I mean, are looking look at? at the, uh, I think it's a parental perennial problem for governments is that we're we, we're struggling to keep up with the, the the pace of change here but there's efforts underway in Australia a review of the Privacy Act for example uh, uh, we're pulling together a national data security action plan uh, and we're working with the UK and the US on on harmonization there on data security issues um, but yes I, look frankly it's it's an area where even for a, a pretty agile government like Australia in which we have a joined up legislature and executive branch, we can pass legislation quite quickly, we, we still uh, are struggling with. Yeah. I mean, look, I think, I think we try to focus on, on cyber security, which is a really hard line to draw, because I think there are times when you can't separate cyber security from privacy and you can't separate cyber security from other things. So this, you know, the, the Chinese tech question that came up was partly a cyber security issue, was mostly not a cyber security issue. Uh, but falls into a similar similar kind of bracket. I think the other thing about what we try to do in government is, at the moment, we are trying to um, reduce at scale um, cybersecurity risks in the economy, and that means things like regulating, uh, putting in policy for uh, technologies to, to reduce that at scale, and then looking at how we make sure companies are doing the right thing to manage residual risk after that. I think when a, when, a, when a technology hasn't been kind of adopted in a wide, wide scale way, I don't think we then necessarily look at, um, unless, unless we think it's going to form the basis of a future kind of civilization, uh, you probably wouldn't be looking to do anything. But, you know, and and even, even when technology is being taken up quite broadly, legislation is still a final, it's like the last thing that you go to. So when we looked at, there are people in the room that have been involved in um, sec uh, the secure by design stuff for, um, I was trying to, there's, there's no one I can see, but there's, oh, sorry, <laughs> the secure by design um, uh, security um, uh, principles, right, 13 principles. And the hope was actually that we wouldn't need to legislate for this. Uh, the hope was that this would be taken up by manufacturers so that actually government doesn't have to get involved. And then when we saw that actually that risk wasn't reducing, uh, we then went to legislation. And I think that's generally the principle. Now, you know, cloud services, ma managed services, I think, you know, are, I think it would have been wrong to do this too early because their uptake has, it has provided incredible benefits for businesses, right? You do not have to have a you know, um, financial, financial account, I think back 25 years ago, you'd have a financial accounts and systems department in a medium-sized company with two or three people, you know, managing those ledgers and that kind of thing. You can now run a, a cloud-based a cloud uh, finance system, right? So you do not have to have all of these specific expertise in your company. You can run a business and focus on the bit that's the business. There are risks that we now need to look at. So, so I think, you know, 
what we saw was, I think it's something like 7% of companies understand their supply chain risk or actually actively look at their supply chain risk. And that's not, that's not going um, up. And so that's the point at which we say 7%, 7 of companies in well, the UK. How could they know it better? Sorry? How could, how, how could, sorry, this is really loud. How, how could companies know their risk better when companies like AWS don't actually say, here are the potential risks you might have. In fact, it's been like, here's a shared responsibilities model. You're responsible for whatever you put in the cloud. We're just responsible for the security and the privacy of the cloud. So it's a liability model for contracting that everyone extols as being like really good, when in reality, it, it tells the companies nothing about how they're supposed to protect data or how, you know, anything about their cybersecurity risks. I, I, actually, AWS does a better job with security than privacy when it comes to educating. But I guess the big thing I want to say is education is broken around privacy and security. Uh, security is obviously the topic of the day, but so it's broken in that if we wait 20 years before DLT is regulated, when the goal of DLT is to, or blockchain and hash graph or, or whatever, it is, um, is to regulate without, tech, it's technological re regulation without the need for government regulation, right? Like it, the whole point, so if we don't have government kind of like making sure it's safe now, so many people will be harmed or yeah. because they don't understand the risks or that the fact that DLT plugs into distributed apps that are riddled with uh, insecure code because the developers and then basically network effects is what each company wants. That's what AWS wanted, Google Cloud wanted. Now each of these layer one networks wants um, network effects. So they're throwing hand over fist millions of dollars to fund developers to on their networks to build without saying, hey, we need the secure coding. We need to teach people how to do this so that it's safe. And, and so all I'm seeing is just constant like breaches and constant um, not advancing anything forward. Instead, it's, it's, it's making people fearful of using these technologies. Where, and it, it, if it was an obligation that the government made that said, like, look, here's a principle. You have to educate your networks on secure coding. Or, like, you know, you have to uh, give them tips and tools of what not to do. Otherwise, yeah. you know, people lose their keys easily. Or people, you know, there's a lot of, there's a lot there's, of danger. I mean, education awareness is it's, it's incredibly important. The other one that came up was actually people don't know who's in their supply chain. Right. That transparency, and that's not just a service. I mean, that's, that's something that we're seeing more and more of. I think we've had really complex kind of, uh, or we've had models built that are actually much more complex. It's quite similar to the software bill of materials conversation, right? Yeah. You, have this, you have this stack, and it's great, but you don't know what's inside it. Similarly, you are buying in a service, or you're developing a service and selling it on. People don't necessarily know what's inside it. Which is where S-bombs come in, and that's really exciting. The software bill of materials. Yeah, 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 yeah. I sense that we're going to pivot to S bombs soon. I was I was educated on S bombs yesterday. Yeah, so. Gabe. Yeah, uh, my question is, what are the limits of government responsibility in this space as you see them, and can you give me two examples? So I think that was, what are the limits of government responsibility in this space, and can you give him some examples? Is that right? Uh, look, I think I'll I'll go I'll go back to the kind of wicked policy question over here about like the the mono what, what was the phrase you used monoculture monoculture so okay, and I'll go back to the example of the critical infrastructure reforms that have taken place in Australia so um, we wanted to in 2018 when these reforms were implemented we want to have a good understanding of the owners and operators of uh, entities that existed in the, the, the water ports gas and electricity sector um, and so we could have an aggregated view of of who was operating and what risks existed we've subsequently decided we needed to expand that out to, to 10 sectors which includes data pro processing and storage so that then we can map we can have an aggregated view of where and do some modelling on where risk um, exists. What we're not going to do is then um, say to a, a data storage provider in Australia that you need to do X, Y, and Z because there is 
um, a supply chain issue that we've identified and you are spread across X amount of sectors. So that's where the, I think the, it, from, from the Australian government perspective, that's where the, the limit would, would go. We have a pretty good understand. we're hoping to have a pretty good understanding of the risks across the, our broad economy, but we're not going to be prescriptive with how you go about rectifying that, particularly in a market like Australia, which is quite small and we're a tech taker, not a tech maker. So. Um, just who, who asked that question? Um, and it was it, why, why is the government going to come again? Well, so was, was the question, isn't it the like where does government res responsibility end? Is that what you were asking, or where does it begin? Yeah, where, where, where are the limits? Yeah. As, as you see them. What? Last time. What are the limits? What are the limits? So, so. Wait, so. Let's give an example. Where you tried to do something. Okay, so what have they tried and what's not I, worked? I, I, I can, I can totally give, different question can, and a very fun question. I can give half a dozen <laughs> examples, but you, you, I mean, you go I, first. I was going to answer it slightly differently um, in that th this is absolutely the responsibility of organisations. You know, organisations are responsible for their cyber resilience and it is a big part of UK government policy to help make companies aware of what to do, like what is good, that they are responsible for this, that there is a cost to not doing this well, and to factor that cost into how the board makes decisions about investments and priorities. I think there is a point where it crosses the line of being a business decision when it starts affecting hmm. um, you know, safety and security and national security. And in areas like critical national infrastructure, there is a responsibility of government to say, it's not just down to organizations to make this decision. Government must make sure that a minimum is being done in these areas. And I think that's where government responsibility begins. I think it's really difficult to then say, every organization in the economy must adhere to these uh, certain things, because actually there are companies um, that, you know, Ha companies are best placed to make decisions about their risk and I think the example I use at the moment is a lot of companies in the UK are more worried about inflation and what that does to their business than cyber risks and they're quite right to do that. If we start telling a corner shop that they must protect their um, point of sale system and worry about that more that and it's what it's what Chris was saying this morning I don't know if anyone caught his thing about putting cyber in its proper place right. Um, that's not saying it's not important, but it's saying it, it has an importance and you must uh, judge. So I think most of this is how do we get companies to do the right thing and give them all the tools so that they can do it. Yeah, I'll, um, I might jump in here as well. I think one thing we're, um, we're learning in Australia is that it's, it's government's role to also identify what market failures as they're occurring. So, um, and in the Australian context, and, and I don't think it's unique to our economy, it's uh, happening across the board, is we've identified a couple of key market failures and then we need to understand what levers, we, policy levers we can pull to address those. So those are really the two key ones that we've identified are, are kind of negative externalities where the investment in cyber security, there's no incentive to do so. And then that risk is pushed down onto the, the consumer. And you hear Chris Inglis talk about this all the time, that, that like it's a whole society issue and we need to push the risk upstream. That is one of the key things we've identified. The other one is is what we are calling information asymmetry, where um, the sellers of products and services have greater understanding of, of those products. The buyers do not, uh, and they uh, we're hearing from small and medium enterprises across the Australian economy that they just not don't have the technical wherewithal to make dis informed decisions, and that's where I think where we as governments need to step in, then you get into a really vexed point of, of what to do because you, you're basically getting into a philosophical argument as do you have government uh, in, intervention in the market or do you go with the, and this is, this is borne out in our stakeholder engagements, do you uh, let the market correct itself because there's attendant, uh, I guess, reputational and financial risk that will be um, will occur in the marketplace. So that's kind of where we're up to. And then we can probably go into what levers we could potentially pull. But I think that's, that's something that we're learning in the yeah. long. So I love the fails question, but is this a, have you got a two-finger? Kind of 
All right, so why don't you go and then we're going to come back to fails, because I think fails is a great question. You go ahead. So you've already uh, kind of half been getting to the question that I was going to ask, but not quite. Um, I was going to ask, uh, government historically tends to be reluctant to take uh, large risks by adopting technology early, um, but adoption of technology tends to lead policy. So whose responsibility is it to uh, lead technology adoption? Is there any way to flip government adopting late and then writing policy for business to government adopting early so that they can develop policy for business Are you aware of any programs? <laughs> so, so I think, yeah, go, so I think government has a um, real, I mean, this, this, is, this is one of the um, things that government can do that businesses can't, right, is that can make investments and get it wrong. Uh, and in the uh, odd event that government gets technology right, <laughs> it will have set a, a precedent. Um, I think actually, certainly from what I've seen in the UK, we're, we're starting to get better in not taking a blind punt on these things anymore. I think it's that, um, you know, when, and I, my, my, my reference point at the moment is something around digital identities in the UK, where we are actually looking at um, enabling that entire market um, by kind of opening up government data sets and, and, and you know, creating that market, um, but actually not doing it in a kind of quick and rash way, but taking time to actually understand you know, what's the security implications? What are the, what are the privacy implications? What are the market implications? Are we gonna create a market with two or three players? And is that where we want this to go? Or do we want a market with 15 players? Are we focusing on a particular industry? Uh, or, or is this gonna be across the economy? And I think more and more, and I think part of this is as government has opened up its process to um, non-government actors and actually um, has built into the process of policy making uh, making sure that businesses, civil society are involved in not just consultations, but the bit way before the consultation on actually formulating the ideas. Um, you know, what is it that we want to see at the end of this process? That's not going to be true across the board. Um, but I think, you know, those models of what, you know, how, how do we, what, what do we want from this and how do we get the right answer before actually plunging tens of millions or more uh, is, is quite important and, and seems to be getting better in some areas. Okay. All right. Um, I'm going to jump back to fails then because I think that was a question that both of you were like, oh, we've got answers on this. What's the question? <laughs> uh, what have you tried that hasn't worked? Um, the, the most immediate, uh, uh, I guess, answer to that question kind of lies not necessarily in the pure cybersecurity policy realm, but more when it comes to, um, and I'm, I'm conscious that I'm sitting next to the expert on this in the Australian government, so I'll have to, <laughs> might defer to her on this. Um, <laughs> um, is, is, was lawful access to encrypted data, and that was an area where like, we tried, and we're still we're still trying, and we're not. Um, the framework that we have in place has worked well in terms of voluntary um, kind of voluntary assistance from particularly social media companies, but it's an area where I, I think we haven't quite got that r r right, and we didn't necessarily get it right in the in the first. The first go round, uh, first go round with our legislation, um, but I'll let Ifan jump in as I well. Can I just say though, I think I think you're very brave in the DefCon room to proactively no, bring I up mean, encryption I, backdoors. I, I, I will say that we're a strong <laughs> supporter of end-to-end -end encryption. Did never change that. that. I guess the the fundamental issue was about ensuring that service providers, um, like they enforce their their terms of services on the networks and work with law enforcement, you know, um, cooperatively. So um, we're not. We're not against the encryption by any means. <laughs> I just want to go on the record as saying we're not against encryption. Well, I, this keeps coming up at every conference I go to, so I, yeah. I'll, I'll put that, that marker down. Thank you. Um, in terms of cyber, does anyone across the table want to give an example of when the UK government has put out a policy question and got it completely wrong? <laughs> this is easy. I'm not the sitting side on this discussion. Um, so first, let me credit um, the UK. I've observed the, uh, the consultations process. I'm in the US, so it doesn't really affect me, but um, 
Uh, in the US, we have requests for comments and various things as well. But it's great to see governments actually asking um, their citizens what they think. Um, and there's been a bunch of cyber stuff out of the UK, which I've uh, had some, some friends, policy friends help me uh, notice that they're happening. Um, yeah, the, the certificate, you know, government certification qualification of cybersecurity professional. Um, <laughs> I you were going there. Which, it's easy. I mean, it's a, it's a dunk, but um, in a way. Uh, I certainly can appreciate sort of the, the desire for that. We have lots of professional societies where you have a credential and you need to keep it up to date and it matters. Um, and I would perhaps suggest that cybersecurity is just too fluid and new yeah. for that. So appreciate the effort, but yeah. no, yeah. Yeah, yeah, and that's what, I mean, I'm glad you didn't say Brexit. Um, <laughs> Can but, I say that? Is that a cyber, it's not a cyber security topic. Is um, it? Uh, but you're absolutely, I mean, look, we, we put a consultation out uh, that said, should, um, should, should cyber professionals be licensed? Should they have a license to practice? It's not, it's, a, it's, a, it's an important question, and it's not the last time this question is going to be asked. And in the future, the answer might be different, right? I think there's a lot of pressure now to get the right people on board who actually understand what's going on and have some kind of a way to make sure that they know what's happening. Licensing professionals um, was also seen as a way that maybe it could, we could improve the quality of cyber professionals in the UK. We have two issues. One is that it's very difficult to tell what credentials a cyber professional has uh, and how qualified they are. And then the other one is uh, we have a gap of 14,000 people, uh, 14,000 cyber professionals a year. Yeah, so more, more barriers and roadblocks to them coming into the <laughs> profession seem like a great idea. Uh, well, it solves one and not the other, right? It, so it, it can help solve the quality question, but not the quantity question. And actually, when we don't know what good looks like in that space, because we're still developing the frameworks of what a, what's a cyber pathway for the 16 different professionals that have been determined by the UK Cybersecurity Council, if we don't know what those pathways look like yet, how do you actually license someone? So, so it was a question that we asked um, looking at what was happening around the world in different places on, you know, some countries do have license requirements for cyber professionals. Uh, and the answer came back as no, uh, and we scrapped the idea um, for the moment. Yeah, and I don't, at the risk of sounding like I'm being horribly patriotic here, um, the DCMS did come back with a response that kind of said, yep, yeah, we heard you, and we're going to take it seriously, and we're going to not proceed on this. And, and similarly with Secure by Design, you originally were like, hey, how about a label? And people went, how about not? And you went, yeah, okay. Um, and I think, you know, the thing that I would say for people in the room who are interested in public policy and how it develops and how they can impact it is that, you know, in, a, in democratic nations, they tend to run these processes, right? As they're building policy, they tend to have consultations. The US runs them, Australia runs them. And actually, uh, through this amazing thing that we have called the internet, anybody can reply. You don't actually have to be in the country. Um, and, and the government will take it seriously. They're not going to look at it and be like, well, you're not here, so we don't really care. Um, and I would just say the, the examples that, that Airfans just shared do sort of highlight why the consultation process is so important and why you should absolutely get involved with it. Um, you know, the, the, the UK government just ran one on um, App Store security and privacy. And... I think as with many of these things, what's typical is you see the people who potentially will get regulated respond a lot. And they all get together and they have trade associations and so they like respond individually and as trade associations. Maybe they create some new trade associations just to really amp up the noise. And they're all like, no, regulation's a terrible idea, we don't need it, it's fine. And actually, the people who care about security are the people who come to these events. And you guys are on the, the sort of front lines of why security matters so much. And so your voices, and maybe you don't agree with regulation, maybe you think actually it's government overreach and it shouldn't be regulated, but the fact that you have that perspective from the front line of security is so important and you can really help shape outcomes. The other thing I'll say, just like last thing on this, while I'm on my soapbox for why you should participate, um, one thing about DCMS, and I don't know if this is true of every government, um, is they really, really like to have a survey. And it's because they like to have both a qualitative response, but also a quantitative response. And it can be a little annoying, let's be honest. 
Sorry. I'm writing it down. <laughs> right, no, that's fine. Trust me, I, I think I've put this in writing already. Um, you don't have to stick with that. There will be somewhere on the website that says, here's an email address where you can send us your thoughts. So you can do the survey or not do the survey, depending on what you want to do. You can also just sort of write a letter that says, hey, here's what I think. And it doesn't completely conform to your survey questions, but like, this is my view on, on what you're suggesting and why I think it matters. And you can email it to them and they will read it, they will consider it and they will take it seriously. So I highly advise you to get involved if you, if you see topics come up that you care about, Amit. Oh, can you, um, can we, can we? Thank you. See, teamwork makes the dream work. Oh, yeah. Can you hear me? Yeah. I'll be brief. Uh, just quick follow up and then uh, a word of thanks. I think one of the most amazing things that we have seen, and especially in the UK, Australia, and other um, jurisdictions as well, is a summary of comments. Uh, where you will be able as a community to also see which comments were in, from what type of entities, how much is individuals, how much is trade associations, from which industries. This is, by the way, also true for the DMCA proceedings that we talked about right. earlier today. Uh, and you can also, so not only you would get a summary of the consultation and the government response, and these are really illuminating if you look at the connected devices, right, for example, com commenting and how impactful that was to the shaping of, of the recent legislation the P PTSI, um, not only you are able to access that and that's a summary of the consultation and can give you ideas of where you want to engage and which questions can most benefit from the tremendous input of this community, you can also re read the letters and the comments themselves that were submitted and that is really helpful to kind of understand the shape and you know the type of arguments that are being made, type of technical argumentation as well. So I just wanted to quickly put that plug and I would agree also in the EU as well, we see a lot of surveys that are coming in and there are, these are very detailed, but there is always an opportunity to engage with, often it's a think tank that creates the consultation for the European Commission and provide them with commentary directly or uh, comments in the shape of the letter. Thank you. That's yeah. Really, really interesting because on that consultation we were talking about before, organizations wanted individuals to have licenses, but individuals didn't want to get licensed. Yeah. So really important that we understand the distinction of who's responding. Yeah, go ahead, Dave. <laughs> <laughs> so, so I just wanted, I thought I would throw another fastball at you, basically. Um, just at the UK in this particular case. <laughs> so you can just chill. We're going to get you a new LinkedIn <laughs> picture, by the way. <laughs> it's too spooky right now. You need at least something deep faked. But um, so if we want to talk about failures from the UK in the past 10 years based in cyber policy. Are we going to talk about Brexit? Is that, is that it? Because I'm, I'm ready. Let's go. Brexit. What, what are you ready for? Brexit. <laughs> no, I was going to talk about export control, right? <laughs> So the UK has the biggest and best penetration testing company in the world at headquartered in the UK, NCC Group. Did the UK communicate with NCC Group on how export control was going to work? No. Right? Like, they didn't bother to ask Ollie Whitehouse if he wanted this to happen or if it was a good idea. And even now, I, I, it's, it's sort of like they're ignoring his input on whether or not it's working or not working. So I feel like... Dare you ignore that one person. <laughs> right. I just feel like it's sort of like we did what we want to do, and now it's up to industry to sort of deal with the issues. And we're not going to even say if it's working or uh, doing anything. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to push back on that. And you and I, like, we've talked about Vasana at length. I think the UK has actually been pretty receptive to feedback and, and actually was supportive of going back to Vasana and saying, hey, we need to look at what the impact is on researchers and looking at the language. So I, I will push back on that a little bit. Go ahead. Sorry, I don't want to. I don't want to halt the uh, catharsis, shall we say? No, I mean, I, I think I think there is a really important, broader point on how we how we kind of do this stuff responsibly, and you know, what you know, what is it that we want to put out there in the world? What kind of practices do we want people to be? undertaking and, and you know what, what what do we want to proliferate 
right? I think we need to be very careful about how we conduct ourselves in cyberspace. I think it doesn't go unnoticed when we do something. It goes more unnoticed than when the US does something. So the US has to be very careful on how they do things and recognize that when people see something, that does that give other people a license to do the same thing? I think the UK has to have a set of principles by which it thinks that this is okay and this is not okay. And I think, and I don't know specifically, I think the export control question came under that. What is it okay for a cyber practitioner for doing what, what is it not? I think Ollie Whitehouse is an incredible uh, individual. Uh, I, actually I really time. like him. He, he <laughs> inputs on pretty much everything uh, we do, along with a number of other, other people. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I, it, it's, it's, it's a shame that this one didn't go that way <laughs> for and, him. And but I, do, but I, think I, there's, think the, the, I think the UK government was very surprised by the reaction. And my sense from having talked to a lot of people who are involved in it is that there were some learnings from the process. But I also think a lot of it was not driven out of, it wasn't driven out of the traditional policy making units. I think that was part of it. I mean, it wasn't a DCMS thing. Right, it was exactly. a broader kind of, how do we, you know, what, what do we do as, you, as the UK and, and make sure that the wrong things don't get out to the wrong people? Um, I don't think it was a problem um, to, to go down that route. the technical people when it's convenient is that no i don't but i don't think this is a technical question i think this was a question on um on principles and on uh, law uh, i'm not sure that this was a you know so so for example when we are the, the app store app security code of practice that we put out recently uh, we had quite a lot of interest from a number of different companies uh, and individuals um on, on what those, we put out six principles. These are the things that apps, app developers and app stores should adhere to, to, you know, similar to the conversation we're having now, um, how do you um, reduce cyber risk upstream? What are the interventions we need to do up here so that the person that's downloading uh, apps to their device um, isn't gonna worry about security because they don't anyway, right? And technical respondents told us things that we weren't necessarily keen on. They told us that, um, you know, we, we need to be looking at enterprise uh, app stores. We didn't really think that that was going to be, we weren't sure how important that was going to be to start off with. Uh, they told us that we can't ask operators to say what good looks like without actually stating what good looks like. Um, I don't think it's that we listen to technical experts when it's convenient. I think we listen to technical experts when there's a technical answer needed, but not everything in cyber has a technical answer. I think a lot of it is around governance, a lot of it is around international norms, I think a lot of it is around stuff that is way outside of cyber technical uh, expertise. Yeah, maybe if we just take a step back and say, okay, so I'm, I'm going to use DCMS as an example, but I think this is actually true of a lot of governments um, that I've seen. So DCMS has expert advisory groups, right, which are people from various different communities that are asked to be part of an ongoing advisory group, and they will basically bring together a mixture of technical, business, you know, strategic, um, international diplomacy, as you said, and so they're getting all the different points of view and expertise, and they meet regularly and go, here's a bunch of stuff we're thinking about, what do you think? And they get that feedback, and then they process it, and they'll then like have follow-ups with little working groups or sub-conversations, and that's an ongoing effort. Then when they get a topic that they're actually pursuing further, that's when you get the open consultations. And anyone can respond to them, that's why they're called open. And then as they're going through the open consultation process, they'll also proactively try to seek responses from specific communities. So for example, a um, number of times they've come to me and said, hey, you know a bunch of people who work in security, can you help us talk to them? And so like, as you know, I'll try and plug them into various people who I think are relevant in different ways, like Ollie. And Ollie's, I mean, we, I know you just picked Ollie because he's, you know, he's Ollie, um, but he's very engaged with, with lots of these groups. Um, and so, and then, and then on top of that, they talk to, existing associations and groups that have the ear of technical people. So I actually do think, and I don't think that's just unique to the UK, I think the US does the same thing, I think Australia does the same thing. So I actually think that there is a huge effort from governments to talk to technical people. I think the problem is that as with anything, and I am laughing at myself saying this because we're in this room, it's an echo chamber. 
And so your trouble is you only often speak to the people you already know. You run an open consultation and you hope you'll get to meet new people. You come to an event like this. I mean, these guys flew here to come talk to you guys because they wanted to meet people who are in the security community and build those relationships and those networks. But you can't force people to participate in the process. And everyone's busy. And so, like, you know, if you have an AppSec uh, um, consultation, I mean, the, the, the guy, Ed, who has been running the AppSec consultation, has done everything he can think of to hear from the technical people in the security community to the extent where he literally, like, I introduced him to some people at OWASP and he sort of went along to an OWASP event with no knowledge of what was going to happen or if he was going to speak or what was, you know, anything to expect because he was like, I just want to hear from security people who care about app security. And so I think the desire is really there all the time to keep it going. But one, yes, it has to be tailored to the specific topic. Um, and, and two, it has to be met on the other side by willingness from the community. Um, and, and the problem we all have all the time is that we're drowning in noise. Like, how do you guys keep up with what governments are working on? Because I have a hard time with it and it's my job. And so for people who it's not their day job, I think it's really hard to do. And we actually talked about this. We were like, I said, DCMS covers digital, culture, media, and sport. Is there a way to do an RSS feed on the website where you just say, I'm only interested in cybersecurity. I don't want to hear about all the press releases for sport. And you were like, that's a good idea. <laughs> right? um, so like, I think there's a noise problem. There's a signal to noise problem um, is, is part of it. Um, the other thing I'll say is, and this is UK specific, although I think Again, in Australia, you have the ACSC, but in the UK, DCMS works very closely with NCSC, and I will fight anyone who says that they don't have good technical experts, because um, they do, you know, it's, it's, it's their job. Um, so I think that you do get quite a lot of technical input, it's just that sometimes things don't go exactly how you thought they would, and Vasana, I think we can all agree, was definitely an example of that. Yeah, go ahead. Like technology companies lobbying play into this because I look at someone like like I look at myself and I work for myself now, but I don't have time to respond to all the potential requests for information and no one's paying me to do so. But yeah, right. if I worked, I've done public policy at Visa, at other places, not government relations per se, but they have huge teams of people that yeah. are responding. And so, you know, how do you get to the people who aren't paid to do so by a company? So this echo chamber that we were talking about, yeah. right? So when we, uh, generally when we put out consultations, the response, like I said, I think at the beginning of the session is, yes, this is the right thing to do, go ahead. And it, a lot of what we get is from the cybersecurity industry. And that's great. It's really, really important that the cybersecurity industry is on board with what we're doing. The other issue is that, so, so we really, we, you know, Way before stuff goes public, we have been talking to tech, um, tech groups and uh, particularly big tech on something like app stores. We absolutely have to speak to the people that are running app stores, otherwise this uh, code of practice is, is, de is dead in the water right before it even comes out. I think we have to be very careful about the technical advice that we get from uh, these companies, right? Because um, there's not a particular company I'm thinking about, honestly, there are, because this is across the board. Security has become one of these things that tech companies use as a differentiator in the market. And when I talked earlier about we have to make sure that, the, that cyber risks are placed alongside other risks, what we see now, and the US is doing a lot about this and the UK is trying to do stuff about this, is um, we definitely need, in certain areas, more competition in the tech sector. Um, we need to do a lot more um, around making sure consumers are protected in the tech sector. Those are economic harms that sit alongside cybersecurity. Now, what we're finding is, because I think um, a lot, all tech policy is new, relatively new compared to things like health and safety policy. So on the maturity curve, we are, you know, really right at the beginning. And cybersecurity can sometimes be a little bit ahead of other policy issues in the tech space, particularly around competition, for example. And so what we find is that companies will be jumping on cybersecurity policy questions 
as a way to say, yes, you should do that. And actually, we need to be careful that it doesn't entrench companies in a way that pr predicates future, com uh, future digital policy questions. And so I think um, we, yeah, we need to be kind of very, we need, we need to listen to the technical side of things, we, but we need to understand that the answer that comes out isn't necessarily going to be to solve that technical problem because that technical issue sits in a much bigger landscape of tech policy and we can't do one bit without the other. Right, right. But, so but we, 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 we might have been guilty of, been, of doing that a little bit in the past. Right, right. So the, and this isn't a question, it's just to, to round that up. Like, yeah, exactly the points about like liability, for instance, or risk, or who, who bears the, you know, the brunt of insurance, or who, you know, all of those things have nothing to do with cybersecurity, right? But, the, but there are still um, lobbyists will be uh, pushing for what's going to be, you know, the best outcome for the company, as opposed to human beings at the, you know, end users, whatever you want to call them. Yeah, I, I'll jump on in on that because I I think I sit in a weird space because I, I you know I work for a security vendor, and I talk to governments a lot, and so I think the way that most people understand the term lobbyist, I could potentially satisfy that term, right? Um, and it's a neutral term, right? No, it's just I, how you I, use I, it. And actually, yeah, like I'm British, so I don't have it. It's not as loaded for me as it is for other people. Plus, I'm talking about cybersecurity, not guns. Um, so, um, which is good. Uh, so. I, I, you know, one of the things that I observe often is that a lot of the conversations I'm in are um, staffed by policy people, people whose job it is to work on government relations and work on public policy. And, you know, the job of a really good policy person is to be a translator and to go and talk to the experts in their organization and build a position based on that expertise and then translate that to the governments and back again, right? Like, and keep going back and forth. But there is a time and a place where the governments need to talk to the technical people themselves, exactly as Dave said. And, and so one of the things that I've always worked on, I mean, a story that I was telling Adam the other night, and I think I've probably told you before, very, I'm like a broken record. When I started doing policy, so I started doing policy purely because I got super indignant about the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act. And um, an angry gen is a bad gen, and I went off to DC to like fix it. Um, and here we are, it's still not fixed. Uh, but the DC, DMCA has, has improvement. Um, but when I went, I met with staffers on the Hill, and this is going back nine years. And they said, oh, you're the first person we've ever spoken to from the security community. And I went, oh? Um, because they were like actively legislating on cybersecurity. And so I was like, how is that possible? And they said, oh, well, we talked to lobbyists from the defense contractors and the big banks and the big tech companies, and we hear from the Chamber of Commerce who don't want anyone to be regulated, but we never actually talk to people who work in security. And I was horrified. And so I made it a mission after that to really try and figure out a way to plug people who are working in security into these conversations, which is why I do things like force these nice people who work for governments to come to events like this. And I think those touch points are super, super, super important. I think we have to create the opportunity for that as much as we can. And I also think it works in the other direction, right? Like it's one thing to sort of capture um, policymakers and then cage them and bring them here. Um, but we also have to look at what the events are that other people have that have nothing to do with cybersecurity and think about how do we plug that cybersecurity reference and knowledge into those events. Like how do we go to the, the, the forum, the fora, that they're already participating in that we don't know about because all we think about is cybersecurity all day long. Um, and I actually think like this is one of the biggest challenges I think cybersecurity faces, whether you're talking about it from a policy point of view or anything to do with adoption, is that we live in an echo chamber and we do a shitty job of breaking out of it. And we spent 30 years basically saying to people, well, it's really technical, you wouldn't understand. And now we're like, oh, but you should understand. So actually, I think that's to an extent, part of why we need to work with governments. Because we have successfully got to a point where there's such a level of apathy around cybersecurity that unless governments intercede in some way, we are not gonna see change as quickly as we need to. And so, you know, it, it, it sort of falls to us, us. It, be, it behooves us to actually engage governments and, and, and have these conversations with them. Um, 
as much as we can. And so, yeah, again, I will be on my soapbox and say to you, please participate, because you're obviously interested because you've sat here for an hour very patiently. I mean, yeah. Can you? Just a really quick follow-up. I think one of the other opportunities, and we've certainly seen it on consultations on connected devices, but also the use of Resilience Act. Um, most of the deliverables under the executive order is that the nature of cybersecurity regulation is becoming more prescriptive and more reliant on technical standards, especially as we go into more central regulation that also needs to have that sectorial lens. And you talked about the critical infrastructure sector and the different needs. And I think that um, that just merits a lot of deep technical expertise on informing this, uh, on informing consultations on the actual technical requirements and the standards in place. And that presents a tremendous opportunity for more technical experts to engage, but also underlines the importance of global engagement. Because again, going to the point of standards, a lot of the con connectivity and interoperability is coming from things like ISO IC standards that are in common to many of the approaches that are underlining different regulations, whether it's called vulnerability disclosure, whether it's connected devices. So I'm just joining Jane call to action of yeah. getting more technical. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, uh, I think it's a it's an issue in Australia. We're, we're struggling to get those like the, the the data points in place. So um, we've been running a process for almost two years now, uh, a best practice cyber regulation task force. And, and frankly, um, if you look at the raw numbers, we had 770 stakeholder consultations and 140 submissions. And I, I guess one of the the key things. Um, we were we wanted to get out of it was that consumer viewpoint, particularly on issues like smart devices and the like. And I will put a plug in for that the task force report, which is on uh, incentives and, and possible regulations that should be coming out soon. And then we'll be engaging through again through consultative processes on the action plans for those. So I, I would. Like keep an ear out for anything that uh, that comes out of Australia because we're just cognizant. We're, like I said before, a tech taker, and that we really need external views, particularly from the US, uh, to engage to shape our our policy frameworks. So, I mean, we have 50 minutes left, and um, I like we are very happy to talk about the the sort of aspects around digital service providers, uh, but it seems as though perhaps questions in the room are kind of drying up on that. I mean, I, I, I might just go back to, I saw a couple of nods of the head when I was talking about some of the uh, the market failures and in incentivizing cybersecurity. So I'd be, right. I'd be keen yeah. to just kind of- Do you want to talk about that a little get, bit more? That would be good. Because we're, 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 we're thinking about, you know, health checks for small and medium enterprises, uh, trust markers and the like, and, and just want to get like unadulterated views on, on those because I, I think uh, we've got some hands. Yeah, can you can you say a little bit more about it, and then we can see if people have feedback for you. Sure. So I mean, one of the like I said before, the the information asymmetries that exist is the small and medium enterprises are coming to us and saying like, if can you put a trust marker in place for uh, MSPs, for example, uh, like because uh, we're, we're unsure of who we should go go with and where the risks lie. Um, so that's one example, and um, uh, the other is just on on governance standards that can apply across the Australian economy. Do we, do we want to be pres prescriptive with those or do we want to have a standards, like a, a, again, just across the board, a standardised approach, so. And, and bear in mind, like, because I know, you know, probably a lot of people in the room are based in the US, um, maybe, uh, but bear in mind, something that policymakers do strive for is consistency internationally. I mean, not to the detriment of their own jurisdictions, priorities and needs, but certainly to attempt to try and create some alignment internationally so that it's not creating an overburden of complexity for those who are covered by legislation. So, you know, while Adam's asking about stuff that's US specific, sorry, Australia specific, it could well have an impact for the US in the long run. So it is, it is definitely worth paying attention to. Uh, hi, I'm, hi, I'm Valerie. Um, just to circle back to um, 
our talk about bringing more technical into the government consultation process. So uh, your story really rang true to me. So I run a national security cyber program at a think tank now, but last year and about a decade before that, I was a Hill staffer um, and am deeply, personally, painfully aware <laughs> of how little they know. Um, and it's, it's better than it was nine years ago, I would say. Absolutely. And, and it was not a criticism of the Hill staffers, right? They're mm -hmm. resource constrained beyond belief. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so one of the reasons why I, uh, one of my goals coming here um, for the first time was to try to figure out, yeah, like who are those people in this community yeah. um, that would be best suited? Because, you know, I have connections to, to put in front of directly, right? Not just the written back and forth. Absolutely. Um, and my current theory is that it's not sufficient just to have the technical expertise, but they also need to, you know, be fluent enough in the policy yeah. world and also, you know, really be self-advocates for it. Like they, they care, they want this outcome for the yeah. public good, right? So if you have any thoughts on who those people might be. <laughs> yeah, de I mean, we can definitely talk about it afterwards. I think, you know, to your point, I think that something that's important to the engagement is you have to recognize that when you come to the table as a security expert, your expertise is security. The person on the other side of the table, their expertise is policy. And so you've got to come to the table, yes, with your, with your expertise and your opinions, ready to go and ready to talk about it, but you've also got to respect the expertise of the person across the table who knows a lot more than you do about how policy works and how the lawmaking process works. And, and actually be willing to collaborate and work with them, not just go, well, this is my opinion, and if you don't take it, then you suck. Um, it has to be a sort of iterative, collaborative process, uh, for sure. Yeah, I was going to say, they need to have the patience um, <laughs> to try to explain the same thing over and over again and fail over and over again. <laughs> right. right? So, um, also, just following up to your point about being a, a translator, that's... that's I, because I, that's how I describe my job all the time. Like yeah. I speak Congress, right? Like I'm not, <laughs> I'm not a tech expert, but I, I think I understand enough to explain enough to members of Congress. Yeah. Uh, two, two very quick things. I know we're running short on time. Um, one, one comment. I think it's important for us to remember too, as a community, that tech expertise is not a monolithic thing, right? Not everybody in the tech in the cybersecurity community agrees as to what's best, and I think it's important for policymakers to understand that as well. That just because somebody who has a great reputation is telling them something, that doesn't mean other people might not agree. And so that gets to the we need more community involvement. It can't be. It's not just about lobbyists. It's about who has a strong voice, who's out there, right? So, to your point, Adam, and you were talking about MSPs. I think is where you were sort of leaning, right? I think more attention needs to be paid to MSPs 100%. I see it all the time in my risk management job. Small companies, finding the right MSP, finding an MSP that understands cybersecurity makes a huge difference. I think what we need to do is we need to target more of our guidance to MSPs. We got tons of guidance out there around how organizations should secure themselves. I do not think we have enough educating MSPs on how to understand cyber risk for their clients, okay. what are the things that they need to be doing, and how for their clients, which is a nuanced difference from how you go about and doing it yourself. So I 100% think that more attention needs to be paid there. There's a lot of discussion about that here in the U.S., trying to figure out what that looks like, not just from a policy perspective, but just at the community level, right, at the, the, risk, the risk manager level. So. Yeah. You get a pretty good indication of the, uh, the appetite in the government sphere um, based on the, the output in May of this year by the Five Eyes Operational Agency on um, security guidance to MSP. So I'd encourage you to have a look at that. It's, it was, um, it's, it's difficult enough to get the Five to, to publish something and something as um, vexed as the MSP issue was pretty significant, I think, and that was... I'm cognizant I'm on, on camera, but it was, it was about um, giving signals to customers that they should be demanding more from MSPs, frankly. So uh, I'd encourage you to have a look at that as well. This microphone isn't great. Um, <laughs> there you go. A, a shift towards like micro businesses. So people who are in the service industry, especially, and they're very reliant on tech platforms, you know, for their, their following and marketing and they get a lot of business that way. And it seems like um, we kind of push all of the responsibility for security onto the platforms they're using who might not hand, treat them as a business. They treat them as an individual. And I was just wondering if that 
market and that kind of shift in what business means um, is something you guys are discussing at all. So it, I think it falls into our kind of broader question on how do you get smaller companies to take this stuff seriously, right? And so we're trying to, I mean, there's the, there's the MSP guidance uh, that was mentioned, and there's the kind of MSP best practice if you're, you know, for, the, for the customer. If you are a two-person operation or a three-person operation, you're f filing your taxes, you're doing your accounts, you're paying your payroll, you're opening and closing, you're you know, trying to find customers. Throwing in cyber um, stuff, doesn't, it, doesn't, it doesn't land. Um, and so that's why um, we need to, oh, good title, we need to move this upstream because uh, those people are not going to, uh, we put out all the guidance in the world. Uh, we actually even have a certification program for small businesses called Cyber Essentials. People won't do it. <laughs> it it's, the uptake is small. It needs to be much, needs to be much bigger. Uh, but, but it's really difficult to get small businesses to, to do this. And quite rightly, their, their time's limited. So um, the more that we can get um, those... But, 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 then, but then when you're a slightly bigger business, your risk profile is different. And it's not just about what those you know, 10 companies that are providing you with services are, it's the, the 50 companies um, and how you manage that internally and dealing with your kind of internal um, environment if you have one. And actually, I think at that point, there's probably more of an appetite to start understanding this. And that's where the kind of how do you drive good behaviors, good guidance comes into place. You have a, a question next to you. Maybe we can just leave it. Sorry, thank you. Just on the back of that, um, yeah, I, I'm a researcher in Scotland and I did some work for the Scottish Government on the back of the Cyber Essentials campaign and trying to get um, um, small medium businesses, but more particular small charities, to take up the Cyber Essentials movement, which even with an incentive grant of £1,000 to help upskill them, the charities still didn't have the capacity to submit the grants to actually get the money to make them do it. Um, and, and I wondered, how do we fit the voices of those types of organizations where they're, like ultimately their primary agenda is providing services to their service users as a charity um, and, and fitting their sort of everyday routine and the contours of their everyday running into this conversation as well. Yeah, look, I think that's, um, that's something we're also considering in Australia. And I mean, one of the, yeah, one of the things that we're like, I, I, I you're, you're, you're right on when it comes to the contours of their daily operations. We want to make it as sim simple as possible for them. Um, so is it through a vector for information coming through their, their bank, their financial provider, or, or their insurer? Like, there's a cacophony of information out there that they can, get, uh, they can access via government websites, but they're, they're not going hunting for that information. We want to streamline that process and push information out through their the, the trusted uh, networks that they have in the data operation of their business, something we're, we're considering. I mean, the thing, the thing that people sometimes forget is that charities um, sometimes deliver critical services, often deliver critical services, care services, end of life services, um, getting people food services, um, but don't fall under any critical infrastructure um, uh, laws. And I, I, it's a gap, but it's not one that you don't want to stick charities into critical national infrastructure because the things that they would have to do would mean that they would shut down. And so it's about finding how it's, it's that putting it, putting cyber in its place, right? Uh, which means not getting rid of it, but making sure that it sits in there in, a, in, in the right kind of part of the risk register. Um, it's going to be a challenge. It's going to continue to be a challenge. <laughs> yeah, go ahead. Last quick thing on the MSP that I forgot to mention that's something that I think is an interesting idea. I found one for a client, small company that I work with. This MSP will not take customers that will not implement multi-factor authentication, will not implement certain patch practices. They'll just, they'll say, no, we, you cannot be a customer if you don't do these things. And so while it's important that we educate SMBs on the questions to ask their MSPs, I think it's really important to get the MSPs to start saying, no, you have to do these. You have to do these things or you can't be a customer of ours. Now, that seems like tough love in a way. But this is a lot of MSPs are worried about um, 
customers being the um, the weak point for them, rather than customers worrying that the MSPs are the weak spot for them, right? It's mm. it's it's a, a, a poorly um, a, a customer with poor cybersecurity uh, actually leading to a uh, a breach uh, for for other customers. Uh, hugely important. So, uh, so, not really. This may not apply to the MSP uh, piece of the puzzle, but. Um, Right, small, medium enterprise, micro, right, half part-time person enterprise business. Um, I think the charity is something I hadn't considered. Right, that could be a large, like the Red Cross is a large organ, medium, large organization. Uh, I feel pretty strongly that they're the only option for this these classes is um, the providers and vendors have to do pretty much all of the security for them, and it's great to give them guidance and it's great to give them grants. At, at scale, it's just never going to work, and that—that's maybe true of a more mature organization. But obviously, as you get a bigger company, and they can afford their own internal IT and security, and they can select MSPs carefully, that's a little bit of a different beast. Um, but and, and for consumers as well, right? I cannot be. Uh, where's my phone anyway? Like I can't be a complete Android security expert and analyze every app that I get. We need the app store and the provider, my service provider, and the. OS provider to just give me secure stuff, push patches, secure defaults. So I think that's the only at scale hope, which now gets sort of into the you know, yeah. title of the talk, right? And and this becomes sort of a responsibility liability ish question. Um, so I think that's where the this at scale answer really is for anyone who doesn't have their really own well funded internal capability. I mean, that it, I can't remember who it was, if it's Microsoft or Google, but one of them is enforcing two-factor by default now um, as part of their cloud service. I can't remember which one, but they've said that they were going to do it. I, I'd be really interested to understand what impact that has on global cybersecurity, because it will have a big one, I am sure. <laughs> uh, and it's what, you know, what are those other interventions that we can find that will, will do those things? Did you have a thing earlier? I did, but it has nothing to do with what we're talking about. Okay, let me take this one first and then come back to you. Um, so I work for US government and one of the policies that is kind of rolling out right now that's affecting a lot of different, uh, or at least in different ways, different agencies and that sort of thing is called Section 889, I guess it's of the executive order. It affects, um, it basically prevents federal contractors from uh, obtaining technology services or uh, products from anybody that is sort of affiliated with Huawei or any of their affiliates. And what does that list look like? Who knows? It's, uh, you know, uh, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of companies that uh, if you're a federal contractor, you have to figure out if your supply chain includes all of this. So anyways, it's just interesting to think about how that level of um, sophistication is pushed onto companies, and at a certain point, is there, as a, in a regulatory position, do you have, what's your thought in terms of situations where, yes, within the UK or within Australia, you have full control of the situation to some extent? Um, if there's a company that needs to run uh, a separate network or system or purchase from a different vendor overseas for their overseas operations, how does that impact them as well? Um, so, I don't know, it's kind of a big question. Uh, look, uh, uh, a huge, huge question. And look, I think it goes back to um, uh, having an appreciation of what the risks are in terms of any particular sector. I think, I think um, we're not, like I said before, we're not going to be prescribing um, a certain technical solution in any sector because we don't have the, the expertise to do so necessarily. So, um, yeah, vexed, a wicked, wicked policy question. Yeah, I mean, I, th I think. Um, we need to understand what risks we're calculating for, right? Are they cybersecurity risks? Are they, um, you know, are we worried about privacy? Are we worried about human rights? Um, I think, yeah, it, it's, it's, it's a big one. Um, and I don't know, I don't think we have something similar in that sense. I think we are in the UK at the stage of defining what high risk is and why it's high risk. And that will then define who should be using them and who should not be, right? The UK, I think, didn't say 
for Huawei, it should not be used at all. It said there are instances when it should and it shouldn't be used and it should make up a certain amount uh, and was trying to correct a market failure issue in that sense as well. Um, and so I think there were a number of different risks. I don't think it was straightforward as that's a company to not use. There will be instances where the UK government might say that's a company to not use. Um, and then it will depend on who you are. And I think there are some absolutes, right? So uh, even with the MSP question, for example, when we're talking about small MSPs, we're still trying to figure out the answer of if you are a small MSP, but you supply a critical amount of critical national infrastructure, do we still make the same exemptions to, uh, to you to, to not have to undergo certain requirements? And, and I think the answer is no, right? If you are supplying into critical national infrastructure and you're a significant part of that, you know, if you're a medium, small medium enterprise and you're doing that, I mean, you've done really well, uh, but you have obligations for national security reasons. Michael. So the United States is about to get its first cyber ambassador. What should be number one on this agenda when we take it? It's the first one we're rushing to the mic for. <laughs> I mean, I. I I, th I think that the new ambassador has pretty much outlined his Ford agenda in the CFR paper. I don't know if you've had a look at that. Um, I thought it was a pretty balanced uh, piece of work and, and I don't know, I didn't catch his test. Has he testified yet before the, the, yeah? Okay, I didn't catch it, so um, I'm sure he, he outlined it there, but we're, we're certainly very excited uh, for the position to be a place and, and see it as the kind of final piece in the cyber leadership for the US, which, which I think has been operating quite well, and it'll be interesting to see how he slots into the, the leadership structure that's already in place. So I don't work for our foreign affairs department, so I'm a bit of a bull, bull in the china shop on this one. Nor do um, I, so. <laughs> oh, so I'll say what they can't, Russia, China, there you go. <laughs> so I'd say something really different to that. I think that, I think that the thing that the US, the UK, Australia, countries that can do this well need to promote how, to, how countries do cyber resilience well. I think so much of the global conversation on cyber is around, is, is, is around this kind of um, cyber, cyber warfare or around um, norms and laws and uh, you know, those quite big questions quite rightly are at the front of the agenda. But I think the answer to them, I don't think we've hit the right answer to them yet. I think the, a, a big part of the answer which we don't take advantage of is if you can get, if you can do something, Doing cyber resilience well is expensive for a country because it's a cost on people for people and it's a cost for companies. Um, and I think a lot of countries actually take this down a slightly different route and say government will do more, so companies have to spend less on this. And I think that is a false economy because actually it's not cheaper for governments to do it because companies are still unprotected. And then what you have is a change in the dynamic of who is. Um, policing the internet in that country. And so I think the more we can put cyber resilience at the front of the agenda as the answer to how should cyber be governed in the world, the better it will be for those countries to remain resilient, but actually the global conversation on how cyber is governed. So if the cyber ambassador is listening, yeah. this is not coming from the UK government, this is coming from <laughs> And uh, uh, I'll personally. just add one, one more point to that. If you, if you look at the way that certain um, state-owned enterprises are operating in the Indo-Pacific, in particular Southeast Asia. They're investing a lot of money into uh, training, workforce development, and essentially undergirding government systems with uh, uh, their enterprises, their, their solutions, I should say. And we're very keen for countries like the UK and the US and Australia to lean in in that respect as well, um, because I think we're particularly in Southeast Asia, we're seeing certain entities do that quite well. Um, and there's been a bit of a gap in terms of our diplomacy and capacity building and partnership in that region. So that's one other thing I, I would add. Mr. Corman, I see you moving towards the microphone. Sorry, Emily. Um, to try to add some dimension to this that we spent a lot of time on the last two days of B-Sides Las Vegas and a lot of my time at CISA, is whether it's the carrier's opportunity to do things at scale uh, the, um, for some of these network um, 
for the things that can be handled at the network that we handle them at the network and for advice to countries who don't have enough infrastructure or money to do the cybers or cyber resilience well um, I, I, I think it's not always about adding cybersecurity. I think it's about removing dependence or um, proportional dependence. And, and I talk a lot about proportionality. There's a great cost to connectivity in most of these critical infrastructure providers who have had cyber attacks in the last two years. They're the target rich cyber poor. So we can try to give them money and training and staff that we don't have over the next several years and or we can right size how connected we are proportional to their ability to, to operate that responsibly. So in the carrier discussion, I think um, instead of maybe doing this everywhere for everyone, the MSI SAC in the US during the elections did free domain, malicious yeah. domain, domain blocking service for election authorities. They also did protective DNS services. So these are the kind of things I think could be useful for hospitals, right. water treatment facilities, the cyber poor and would scale quite nicely. Other ones will get quite messy quite fast. Um, similarly, you know, one of the first things I said that very first time I went into Fort Meade, one of them uh, knew I was coming from the hacker community and said, what do the hackers think of our capabilities? <clears throat> and my answer was, I think, I assume we're really, really good at offense. We're really, really bad at defense. We probably take comfort in the assumption the same is true for our adversaries, but we forget as the most connected nation, we have much, 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 much more to lose. And that's my big fear here, is it's not so much that we should be helping people defend smart, connected water treatment. It's that maybe we should have less smart, connected water until a country or a region is capable of operating that in a responsible fashion. So you can add more cybers, yes. Add more dependence and resiliency, yes. Add more SBOMs and transparencies, yes. Uh, but in the meantime, the fastest path to resilience or safety is to disconnect. And uh, yeah, so I mean, the extreme of that is we go back to not being connected, right? We 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 pull the, the extreme, right? Just as a not, I know that's not what you're suggesting at all, um, but and I, and I think this is where the uh, you you missed my speech on proportionality as well. <laughs> um, and it's really important that therefore those decisions get made on a sector by sector basis. You know, there are, you know, I think the the there are certain sectors, I'm, I'm thinking civil nuclear, for example, that its entire operating model is based on being able to shut down safely, whatever the scenario is. I think what we don't want to do is start putting cyber as a, I mean, I'm talking slightly out of my depth here and on some quite critical uh, issues, but actually I think there are, there are things that are already in place to prevent catastrophic uh, incidents happening, whether there is, whether it's, you know, whether it's a cyber incident or not, and I think there are things that are changing that calculus by being slightly too connected, is what, which is what you're saying, um, and actually it's, it, it is then up to the industry and government behind it to say there are certain things that you need to do to prevent this, right? So, you know, as an example, absolutely everything that is connected to a operational environment should be air gapped. Maybe that's the thing that we go with. Right. But but I think um, I think there are also industries where that's completely inappropriate. And uh, there's that balance then on security versus innovation. We don't know what smart water, you know, whatever might do, uh, but actually the benefits might might way outweigh the risks. Yeah, and, and on the air gap part. Um I mean, most of us know air gaps almost never are, um, even if you think they are. But, but more deliberately, if you go to the World Economic Forum or you go to a lot of the digital transformation summits, they're very confidently adding 12, 16, 20 deliberate perforations to that air gap for predictive maintenance right. and efficiency and data science. And they're doing it because none of us told them the cost of doing that. Doesn't mean they wouldn't still do it, but they have not baked in the true cost of that project. So not only have we had exposures beyond what we thought, we're aggressively and deliberately adding more uh, exposure. Okay. Um, so we have 25 minutes left of our allotted time. Um, I guess my question to the room is, do people want to spend more time on digital service providers or we have already kind of been doing this, but do you want to take the last 25 minutes as basically a uh, an AMA for the Australian and UK governments here. 
I'm losing my voice now, unfortunately. Um, I mean, we've already gone off topic pretty badly, but like, so, uh, are you, <laughs> I'm sort of just volunteering you guys for this. Uh, but if people have other questions that are relevant to like other areas of policy and you want to ask these guys about it, um, we do have 25 minutes we can use for that. I, I thought a hand might go up pretty quick then. Um, all right, so Rebecca, maybe you could just move to that microphone. With the work. Thanks, sorry. <laughs> And I apologize if you talked about this before I got here, but I still want to hear the answer. Um, what are your governments thinking about when it comes to spyware and surveillance software? That's not come up. You're all good. Are you firmly in favor? <laughs> <laughs> Again, another uh, vexed uh, issue, I guess. And we're, um, we're in a position in Australia where not necessarily this huge uptake in terms of, uh, well, entities that are in Australia and their operations as well. We're um, not to be naive in that respect. We certainly have to monitor that space and um, we watch what has happened with NSO, uh, for example, with great interest and we're um, and certainly interested in, in the way that the, the possible um, acquisition by an American entity was shut down and the way in which that was done so by the administration and the clear signal um, that that sent. So uh, I thought that was somewhat surprising, um, um, but keen to hear Fun's views. Yeah, I, I think um, the UK tries to take a leadership role in global cyber governance issues and it's difficult to do that um, if we don't kind of have a an active voice on the proliferation of cyber tools um, we know that these things can go really really wrong um, we know that there are they are um, a risk to human rights in in many ways um, we've seen it actually uh, we've seen that be used um, I don't think it's limited to things like spyware though I think uh, we need to be very careful about how uh, commercial cyber tools are um, managed. In fact, this is a question that came up slightly earlier uh, on export controls. Yeah. Uh, how do we manage kind of um, this stuff? So, you know, um, I think we need to be very careful about being active and vocal on this um, because otherwise we really lose our ability to stand up in front of a crowd and say, this is wrong. Um, and, and not just that, actually, these are the kind of tools that are used against uh, actually, I think spyware tools were used against UK government personnel, uh, certainly like you know many government personnel. Um, but you, I think the UK was one of them. So, uh, and I think they have the UK government has been quite vocal on um, uh, tools used, uh, whether it's in the UK or elsewhere, um, and that they shouldn't be uh, commercially available. Yeah, and I think the other point to add there is that we continue as democratic nations to articulate the limits that we're prepared to uh, to take in cyberspace. The operations that are undertaken by our agencies obviously very sensitive, but we we need to keep articulating where the lines are and and what responsible behaviour in, in cyberspace looks like. So we'll, we obviously might be very mindful of that and. Um, and, and, and frankly, the, the need to engage through the UN process on, on these issues as well. Any other questions or comments, feedback? Providers for a second. Yeah, That's please. Not bad form. Now that's great. Kind of away That's from what it. we're here for. Um, good. Um, so, I, I heard you say something earlier, and I want to make sure I heard it correctly, and, and maybe some follow-up thoughts on it. Uh, there clearly is a balance when we look at regulation versus sort of market forces, right? And sort of letting those things figure themselves out. I think you you started to describe at one point. You know, there are a lot of good things that are happening with digital service providers um, where cybersecurity and doing good security and doing good privacy has become a market differentiator. I'm wondering if we have a sense of where is the threshold where we say, you know what, this they're actually doing pretty good, they're doing it pretty good consistently, so let's just take a step back from regulation. Maybe we don't need to do it because they actually seem to be doing what we, what we want them to do. Any further thoughts on that? 
and that's open to everybody. I just. Um, so we try to keep. We love we love a survey in DCMS, as Jen <laughs> said, right? So so we have a number of different things that uh, that that we keep an eye on, uh, and one that we'll be keeping an eye on is how actively um, organisations. Uh, monitor their uh, or, or have a, have a grasp on their digital supply chain. Um, I think we will, we'll, you know, we'll, we'll be looking at how legislate. I mean, the legislation hasn't come into uh, come into place. It hasn't even gone into Parliament yet. It's just the proposals that we've kind of consulted on. We will be looking to see how that changes over the years. You know, if that seven percent goes to ninety seven percent, we will pull back because it clearly wouldn't be appropriate for us to to legislate if all companies are aware of their. Uh, cybersecurity and sorry, the next bit is and they're doing it well and it's working and supply chain attacks are reducing. It's really difficult to get that nuance of information, right? And then the other thing that we will not be able to we have we don't have, but we should we should find a way to do this is what are those relative costs? What is the relative cost of poor cybersecurity in digital supply chains um, versus the other things that digital supply uh, digital sorry poor cybersecurity and digital service providers versus the positives that actually not, um, you know, allowing those digital service providers to continue without regulations and grow in, in the ways that they have been. You know, what we don't have a num one number versus another number because those we're, we're quite immature in our policy development for cybersecurity. But I think as, um, as, as technology, that technology policy space develops, those kinds of valuations should be done and will be done. And it won't just be around cybersecurity, it will be around um, costs of data governance, for example. Um, costs of, um, yeah, uh, com competition policy and those kinds of things. So I don't know that we have the answer to all of those yet, but it's, you know, some of it will be around breaches, some of it will be around um, user awareness um, and, 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 yeah. No, I would just add that um, through the work we're doing uh, and the, the Cyber Best Practice Regulation Task Force in Australia, I think we, we got pretty clear feedback that there was areas, particularly on smart devices, where we the consensus view that was we need to, to move on regulation in line with what the UK uh, is seeking to do. And f frankly, as we've discussed, we're very careful in the in the process of consultation identifying issues and then moving through to legislation. That was probably one of the, the key areas where I think we're going to move, potentially move the, the rest of it. I think um, we're still in a, in a process where we need to go back out and consult uh, pretty thoroughly on it. So we have mandatory incident reporting for critical national infrastructure. Yeah, um, as does Australia. Yeah. So it's difficult to get ahead and tail of the data because they sit with the regulators, and and that obligation doesn't currently sit with. If I'm right, which I'm, it's about fifty percent of the time, <laughs> um, doesn't sit with digital service providers at the moment. Yeah. They are they are uh, regulated in a slightly different way. So. I think it's a really it's a really interesting tool, uh, but as with a lot of policy, the devil's in the detail. Yeah, and I think one of the interesting facets of the cyber incident reporting regime that was just legislated in this country was the transparency that will um, is included, in which most I think most people didn't pick up initially. But in talking to the staff of the committee you pulled together, was they're quite deliberate in ensuring that there was transparency of the information and to get an aggregated view of what incidents look like and whether or not where there's a maturation process there. So I'd be very interested to see how that's digested by other countries and whether yeah. or not we look at something similar, because it's certainly not something we necessarily had thought of in the Australian context, but talking to the folks on the Hill who, who drafted it, they wanted that con consistent feedback from CISA as to what they're seeing and the trajectory of things and whether or not 
it's working and to get it like I said before aggregate a view of what's happening so yeah <laughs> If I, if I can build off that a little bit, um, I said this to some of you yesterday, the NIST, the voluntary only NIST cybersecurity framework was in some ways a, a stall tactic to not regulate, right? We, we didn't want a heavy hand of government before we knew more things. And one of the, if you, if you were involved in those, one of the promises was with this framework to stimulate conversation, we could also look at which types of controls are and are not adopted, what the correlation is between these sets of controls and breaches and things like that. But uh, I had to testify in May um, about should we make a NIST cybersecurity framework overlay for healthcare? And I said, you don't even know who's using it yet because there was an Office of Inspector General report and I think it was a single digit percentage of the healthcare sectors even attempting to use it 10 years later. So with this new mandatory breach reporting and transparency, great, but there's three and a half years of rulemaking before we'll even see it start to kick in. And, and I, I continue to argue that the adversaries have set the pace and the tempo and our very good faith desire to move slowly and judiciously and let's not be rash and let's not over-regulate. Uh, I would argue we have under-regulated uh, and even the voluntary thing hasn't had it. So I've been advocating for things like any sort of safe harbor, any sort of forgiveness is tethered to your ability to have attestations of your posture against something like the NIST cybersecurity framework or um, that you aren't being compromised for something I would consider negligent, like the Sysadak of bad practices. So I think there has to be a middle ground between, you know, they're doing good enough, so let's not regulate them or let's do voluntary for 10 to 15 years. Like if we really want to be a learning organization or a learning country or a learning sector, we should get some baseline performance uh, objectives and measurements and then play with them over time I, I love I love that because uh, as part of the new national cyber strategy there is a performance framework that sits alongside it a baseline of what is currently happening and uh, what we would like to see after one two three and five years um, and then we will need to measure it and it's things like are critical national infrastructure companies complying with the cyber assessment framework, which is mandated to them. Uh, what is the uptake? Is the uptake, uh, the rate of uptake in companies going up or is it going down? Yeah, so, that, so there's a question on under the strategy is what we, are we achieving what we set out to achieve, which is, you know, improving all of these practices? Uh, and, and actually, is all of that stuff still right? <laughs> Have we missed something? Do we need to move in a different direction? Um, in terms of under regulation, the only thing I'd say is there is a there is in the UK those regulations for most of critical national infrastructure came in in 2018. So com com companies have had three four years now to get come to terms with it. I I still we still think that's early. We still think four years is at the beginning, and co companies are just starting to get through their kind of first cycle of board um, you know board membership board reporting on what's been happening. Uh, the next five years will be very interesting and I think we'll, we'll you know, I think, I think after, after this strategy, this UK strategy which has just been published in December, the next one will be kind of, it, it will very much depend on how successful our initiatives have been. Do we go kind of mandatory on a lot of things or actually has this approach worked? <laughs> Only about 60% of it. Have you watched have you watched the undeclared war in the UK? <laughs> I don't think they've had it yet. <laughs> but I mean how like if it's undeclared, I mean thresholds. We need thresholds. At, at what point does it get bad enough? You would like after the session is over, we have tickets and you can go next door and discuss some more about this for a beer or yeah, I don't know. for drinks. For drinks. Sorry. Yeah. Um, <laughs> that is a thing. Well, so I think we actually have a session next door, don't we? No, there's a. She tells me this is going to be the room they put me in. 
Oh wait, the gavel battle's in here? I thought it was next door. The tickets are for next door. Okay. Sorry, the, so the gavel, are the gavel battle's in here? Okay, so yeah, we can wrap up. Um, so just can I just on Michael's Michael's very a very quick answer. One yeah. of them, one of the points is going to be public appetite, because it's politicians in the UK. We can say certain things as civil servants, and politicians will drive the legislative agenda. When it, you know, I think a lot of this is how public opinion shifts, so that ministers say this is a priority for the next legislative agenda. I don't know what it would take. Uh, but I think that public opinion bit, political appetite, is a really is is the you know one of the key drivers. Yeah, I, I I'd agree uh, with that, and also add that like the the scale, if it tilts in terms of cost for operating in, in Australia in terms of businesses, I, I think that's where you're we're going to have an appetite to really legislate. But we're not there necessarily yet. No, you're good. I'm just double checking where it is. Um, okay, so it seems like it might be in both, which is really weird. Uh, so for those who are um, interested in policy but want something a little lighter than this, uh, from six to seven we have a session called Gavel Battles, Chaotic Gavel Battles, um, where we will be uh, challenging for security, I want to say experts, because one of them sitting just there, um, we'll be challenging for security experts to battle it out with micro debates on policy related topics um, and uh, and the audience will vote on the winner and the losers will drink. Um, so it's going to be messy, it's going to be ridiculous and it's possibly next door or in here but somewhere. Um, the, the schedule doesn't say, I think it's next door. Um, <laughs> all right, thanks very much. Thank you to our speakers. Thank you everyone. Thank you.